Empress Irene was the first woman in Europe and in the entire Western civilization area that ruled the country on her own. There had never been one before, and uh, after her, there were many. Uh, just for that alone, she's important historically because she showed that it was possible for women to really do an incredible job as heads of states. In the United States, some people talk uh, excitedly about Hillary Clinton becoming the first woman president, but in Constantinople, in the Eastern Roman Empire, there was a woman ruling the entire empire 1,200 years ago. And she had numerous achievements on her record to show the capability of women and also to show the tolerance and openness of orthodoxy to women in position. Okay, she was, she's known as Irene from Athens. Uh, she came from uh, the area of Athens, apparently from a noble family. Uh, she was born around uh, 750. Uh, precise figures of her life are in some disputes, but it was around 750 AD. And about 18 years later, uh, she was uh, actually called to the court in Constantinople to marry the son of the reigning Emperor Constantine the Fifth, And she married him. Uh, and after uh, about a year, she had a child who was destined to be a tragic figure in many respects, uh, who became much later Constantine the Sixth. Uh, her husband was Leo the Fourth, took over the empire, but he died five years later, and Irene uh, became the regent of the empire, ruling the empire in the name of her son. And <clears throat> as such, she had more power than any other women ever had on the European continent. And uh, she became involved in a number of major issues. The most important issue that she was involved with is the issue of iconoclasm. And we have to go somewhat into iconoclasm. Uh, we have uh, for centuries, there's been a controversy among Christians uh, regarding whether icons, which means images of saints, of Christ, and also images of angels, uh, should be uh, venerated or not. And there's certain parties believe that they should be, uh, others believe that they shouldn't be. In during the dynasty that Irene married into, it was declared illegal, actually, to venerate icons. The name of the dynasty was the Isarian dynasty, and it was originally derived from the area of Syria. The Isaurian dynasty uh, became very uh, much a supporter of iconoclasm, and they, they issued a series of edicts actually forbidding the veneration of icons. And in 754, they called a church council, uh, w which had hundreds of bishops who were pretty much forced to, to agree that uh, the veneration of icons should be officially forbidden. And many of uh, the bishops and others and monks who refused to obey were punished, many, some were actually killed, executed, tortured, uh, thrown out of monasteries. Monasteries were closed, uh, were, uh, the orders of the emperor were not obeyed. And uh, there were actually struggles between priests and monks, uh, physical fights regarding uh, icons. Uh, those who were against um, the veneration of icons would attack those who were Iconodules. So you had the iconoclast, the iconodules. And this was uh, actually uh, pretty much um, tearing apart the Orthodox world for quite a few years. Constantine V, who was Irene's father in law, was an ardent supporter of iconoclasm. And her husband, 
uh, who was Leo the Fort, became for, at first he was moderate regarding iconoclasm, but then uh, he became again an ardent persecutor of iconodules and uh, forbidding any veneration of icons. In fact, icons were taken from churches, from monasteries, and many were destroyed, uh, thrown into garbage, burnt, and so on. Uh, and, and then uh, she couldn't do anything. She was the wife of the emperor, uh, Leo IV, and she had to wait. She was known to be a supporter of uh, of iconodules, those who wanted to venerate the icons. And according to one story, her husband, Leo, uh, found that she had an icon in her personal possession, and he became so angry that he wouldn't sleep with her ever again yeah, and because of that. However, her husband died in 780, and she became the regent of the empire. And in fact, the actual ruler is uh, the Dowager Empress of uh, the Byzantine Empire, which at that time was the greatest power in the known world. It included, uh, still included, much of North Africa, included Egypt, included almost all of the Middle East, and included much of uh, Eastern Europe, Southeastern Europe, well, it's like the areas now. Serbia, Croatia, and so on, included southern Italy and Sicily. And it was a huge, very powerful state that existed uh, at that time. She wanted to bring back and legalize the veneration of icons. And actually, uh, she very skillfully, skillfully worked to prepare the ground for that. In 786, she called together a council of the bishops, a council of the church, to meet in Constantinople. And in that council, we had uh, an attack by soldiers who came there, soldiers who were iconoclasts and who were loyal to uh, the earlier emperors who were iconoclasts, and at the point of the sword, they forced the disbanding of that council and ending her uh, attempt to get the church to legalize the veneration of icons again. And uh, she was in danger of being killed, and her son also as well was in danger. But she didn't give up. She then skillfully again, very skillfully, uh, managed to uh, send all the soldiers who were the most ardent uh, iconoclasts to uh, basically uh, to Asian, and she told them they were going to go there to fight against uh, the Arabs. Uh, who uh, The Arabs had been uh, invading the Eastern Roman Empire by the time uh, of uh, Irene's rule, the Arabs had been attacking the Eastern Roman Empire for about 150 years, constant attacks, constant attempts to take over one after another. And uh, it was amazing how well the empire managed to survive uh, based on uh, the incredible odds against the empire uh, by the constant Islamic attacks. So these people went uh, allegedly to fight the Islamic attacks, but when they got there, they were disbanded. And new troops were called into the capital, troops who, who were sworn to obey her and be loyal to her and be loyal to her policies, which was to bring back and legalize icons. And so in 787, she called the Council of Nicaea, uh, which uh, had bishops from all over the Christian world, including representatives of the Pope participating. And the Council of Nicaea had a very serious debate about uh, veneration of icons, uh, with people expressing different views and uh, expressing some why they wanted to 
uh, venerated icons, why others, why they shouldn't. But they managed to actually agree on a declaration in 787 uh, that icons can be venerated, and indeed uh, should be venerated by uh, loyal Orthodox Christians and Christians of all kinds, because uh, I can say that this iconoclastic policy and uh, attempt to outlaw icons was not shared by the Western world. The Pope was a supporter of veneration of icons at this particular time. And this changed the entire uh, empire by legalizing and, and legalizing uh, veneration of icons, which many people believe was a duty of Christians to do periodically, and also uh, calm down the empire, the internal struggle between uh, those who were iconoclasts and iconodules was ended for quite a while based on her. There was, uh, in, and actually in the ninth century, there was a short, much shorter revival of iconoclasm, uh, but uh, it, based on the Council of Nicaea, again, that was ended, and actually it was ended by one of Irene's uh, descendants who had become empress as well in that particular time. Uh, according to uh, uh, Sir Arnold Toynbee, the uh, historian, uh, the iconoclasm was actually fermented by the influence of Islam and possibly Judaism, but especially Islam, because Islam had been, since uh, Muhammad uh, started it on his path of uh, world conquest, had been succeeding in many, many areas. And uh, the Islamic belief was that there should not be any images of any living person. And in fact, the ardent Sunni Islam uh, philosophy is there shouldn't even be images of animals. Uh, and uh, this gave to many people in the Eastern Roman Empire the idea that maybe uh, they were on the right track, at least in part, by the fact that they were succeeding, they were totally against any images of any living person, including Muhammad and so on. Um, and they were succeeding. So maybe God favored them because they rejected uh, any kind of veneration or images of saints, of uh, priests, of God, of anything like that. And so uh, the dynasty that had taken over, the Assyrian dynasty, was actually from the area of Syria, which was under constant attack by Islam. Uh, and they were uh, probably highly infected by that belief system. Because, you know, success uh, breeds imitation. And uh, the Eastern Roman world saw the success of Islam, which within a hundred years of Muhammad, had conquered an area from Spain to India and went beyond to areas of China, and which was far greater than the Roman Empire, far greater than any empire in previous history. And it, this led to the imitation of possibility. Now, other uh, arguments were, uh, the religious arguments that were put into effect were the Mosaic Law, uh, that uh, God said there should be no, you should have no graven images at all, according to the Old Testament. And uh, also uh, the belief, religious belief, uh, by some who are iconoclasts that, uh, you know, like uh, to have an image of Christ and, and in person, as a person actually, is heresy. They actually said it was, it was heresy to have an image of Christ because Christ uh, was a divine person and a divine person couldn't have a physical presence. It couldn't be physically represented. Uh, and, uh, and there were also other reasons as well. Uh, but those who were for the veneration of icons uh, were pointing out to the fact that Christ had a physical body 
And since he had a physical body, the physical body could re represent the way he appeared on earth, at least the way people believed. And also, if Christ could be represented in that way, then also saints could be represented uh, because they had a physical body, manifestation of angels as well, because they occasionally uh, were uh, manifesting themselves in a physical aspect. And also, others pointed out to the fact uh, that uh, in uh, God's direction to Moses and how to build the tabernacle and uh, worship, there were actual, uh, the actual, according to the Bible, God told Moses to have physical images of the cherubim on the tabernacle. So how can you say you can't have any icons when there is God saying you can actually, you not only can, you should have images of the cherubim in that. You know, so uh, there were so many people who said that there was something wrong with the concept uh, that people who are iconoclasts had, that they claim that what was worshipped was the actual image itself, but what was worshipped was, was re it wasn't really worshipped. What was venerated uh, was what the image represented. And they failed, the iconoclasts were said to fail to understand the difference between worship and veneration. You know, worship is uh, worshiping something as holy in itself. Veneration of the icon is venerating and uh, honoring what the icon represents, not the actual physical uh, picture and the physical uh, image that's there. Our son, uh, Constantine the Sixth, uh, sometime after he came of age, he attempted to take the entire power of the empire uh, on his son. He attempted to take the entire power of the empire to become the sole ruler and to sidetrack his mother. Now, uh, she was, at uh, first she accepted that for a short time, but uh, the son actually caused a lot of dissatisfaction in the empire. So in many ways. So one way was that he was inept uh, in militarily and then he had a number of military failures when he tried to lead the armies in the defense of uh, the Eastern Roman Empire. Another thing which uh, really antagonized many people was that he divorced his wife, Maria, and married his mistress. And that was actually considered to be, uh, you know, a great sin, adultery. In fact, he was called the, the adulterous emperor. And uh, then there seemed to be an indication that he was moving back towards uh, being an iconoclast, not completely, but partly. There was an attempt to remove Constantine the Sixth from power uh, in favor of one of his uncles, Nicephorus. And he actually, uh, he had five uncle, uncles, and uh, he dealt with this uh, revolt against him very harshly. He had his uncle's eyes put out, and he had uh, all the uncle's tongues cut. Uh, and then uh, he, uh, he defeated those who were against him with very cruel uh, massacres, essentially, and torture of uh, different people involved. Uh, so he was actually uh, extremely cruel in such uh, ways that he antagonized people. I could point out there had been an attempt to remove Irene from power in favor of the same Nicophorus. Uh, and he, she, the son was so cruel, antagonized so many in the country, that in 797, she actually deposed her own son and took over the power in her own name. And she actually had her son blinded as well. Now, that's very cruel in, according to our standards, but then it was considered more humane uh, than killing them 
or uh, torture him to death, which is uh, what was not done. He lived in comfort for a number of years after that. Um, and uh, he had endangered uh, the whole empire by the way he was acting in many different ways. And uh, the people were largely against him. Now, in 797, she became emperor in her own name, and she, she faced a number of dangers. She had already conquered uh, the iconoclast, so uh, the empire had internal peace. She had uh, removed her son's threat to the stability of the empire, and she felt that her duty was as the ruler of the empire was greater than her responsibility as the mother. And she was willing to sacrifice her son for the good of the people of the Eastern Roman Empire. Uh, and then she faced two huge threats. On the east uh, in Asia, there arose probably one of the greatest Arab rulers of all time called Harun al-Rashid, the Caliph of Baghdad. And he had united uh, many, many of the Arab tribes in a huge army, and he was on the way to trying to conquer the Eastern Roman Empire. In the West, there arose one of the greatest Western rulers of all time called Charlemagne. And Charlemagne was attempting to unite the West and actually was planning on attacking the Eastern Roman Empire. He had planned the invasion of Sicily where the Eastern Roman Empire still had a huge amount of control and forces and uh, very lucrative merchant bases. So she tried to make peace with both of them. So she was a peacemaker in many ways uh, she managed to hold off uh, the invasion of uh, Harun al-Rashid and actually made a peace treaty for, with uh, al-Rashid that uh, they would not uh, continue the invasion. And she persuaded the Arabs, her diplomats, persuaded the Arabs to withdraw from occupied positions. She paid them money. And, that, and some historians claim that this is a sign that she had become subordinate to them. But it's, it's not in any way. It was uh, actually a very calculating decision that it's better to give them money uh, and let them get out than to fight and have m many thousands of innocent people killed. And that succeeded because they withdrew. Uh, the Arabs withdrew. After that, they, years later, they tried again, but for that particular time, they withdrew. And the fact that they withdrew means that they were not on the way to winning because the Arab way in that time, inflamed by Islamic uh, fanaticism, was to try to conquer everywhere they went. The, according to traditional Islamic beliefs, wherever an Islamic army went, that's Islamic territory. To retreat was only possible if there was no victory. So the fact that they retreated, even though they got money for it, means that they failed to conquer what they were trying to conquer. And she actually even provided guides for them to get them out of her territory as soon as possible and gave them provisions, you know, whatever it takes just to get them out of there. And now in the West, Charlemagne, the king of the Franks, had become uh, crowned by the Pope as the Holy Roman Emperor. According to some historians, because the Pope said that a woman couldn't rule an empire, so the Roman throne was empty, and so he proclaimed Charlemagne as such. But Charlemagne never considered himself to be the emperor of the entire Roman Empire. Uh, some people say that uh, Pope Leo named Charlemagne Emperor uh, of the Romans, uh, not because he believed that he really was to be the emperor, but just to remove him as a threat uh, to the papacy, to have the papacy survive by putting Charlemagne in his debt 
so that he would allow him to continue to have a strong papacy afterwards. And uh, the Pope uh, did not expect that the Eastern Roman Empire would accept the title of Charlemagne, which is possible. And that could also be one of the reasons why there's so much evidence that Charlemagne wanted to marry Irene because he might think that he would then have a legitimate title to the empire by being the husband of the reigning empress at that time. He respected Irene so much uh, in many ways. He had been expanding his territory. His goal was to conquer as much of Europe as he could. So he was planning an invasion of Sicily to take over Byzantine Sicily. He was also expanding in uh, Eastern Roman Empire areas. He occupied what's now Croatia, and he was expanding into Bosnia and other areas there, Slovenia uh, and uh, the, Czech, uh, the Czech Republic areas. He was expanding hugely, and he was apparently planning for a military attack on the Eastern Roman Empire. Uh, she dissuaded him from doing that by sending a mission uh, of diplomats to Charlemagne's uh, capital, his court, and there they actually, she did several uh, act measures to make peace with him. She arranged to have peace, so Charlemagne dropped his plans to attack uh, the Roman areas in parts of Italy and other areas. However, later, Charlemagne was so impressed with her that he actually proposed marriage to, according to many historians, uh, there's evidence he proposed marriage to Irene. He didn't really want to have a physical marriage. His idea was to have peace and a united Europe by having a formal marriage with the empress of the Eastern Roman Empire. And, uh, and uh, during her time, there was no, as emperor, sole emperor, uh, from 797 to 802, uh, there was relative peace on both the east and the west. There were some minor incursions, but relative peace. Uh, the, she also had another success militarily in northern Greece. Northern Greece had been occupied by large Slavic populations, and the Slavs were uh, refusing to accept the authority of the empire, which had been in charge there for many centuries. So her military went there and defeated the number of the Slavs and treated them humanely. And as a result, they accepted the authority of the empire. The empire uh, spread. So I would say three achievements in uh, we might call foreign policy. In domestic policy, uh, she showed a lot of incredible care for the well-being of the average people in uh, the Eastern Roman Empire. Uh, she, in Constantinople, in the area of the Church of St. Luke, she provided a whole complex of buildings where people could go to get free medical care, they could go to get free food, old people were given places to live for free, uh, and uh, uh, the laws were passed under her that any poor person and any stranger in Constantinople could get a funeral estate expense, free funeral that everybody was taken care of. But that wasn't enough. She actually cut taxes on the poor people very substantially. And, you know, she became beloved by many of the poor people of uh, the Eastern Roman Empire. One example where, uh, you know, she really became uh, very popular was uh, when uh, there used to be a law in the Eastern Roman Empire that widows of soldiers who die in battle had to pay an extra tax to make up for the fact that the soldier was not available to fight anymore. And, you know, which doesn't seem to make much sense. It doesn't seem to be just at all. She repealed that tax. She repealed it completely, and many widows uh, and families of widows of soldiers managed to live in greater comfort 
uh, because of her actions. And so that was, again, something which made her very popular. She also funded many churches, uh, monasteries, and did more building. I think most historians who study her would or should agree that there had never been a ruler of the Eastern Roman Empire who showed as much interest in the well-being of uh, the average people as she did in many respects. And some of the institutions that she created, like hotels in host hostels, like host hostels in uh, the area of the Church of St. Luke in Constantinople, existed for centuries afterwards. And, you know, and she had soup kitchens for poor people who came there who would eat for free. Uh, and that also existed for a long time. A number of later emperors imitated her by continuing to support such uh, policies, but this was unheard of up to her time. Irene, uh, among her other activities, provided uh, for education for poor children in areas of Constantinople and some of the other cities as well. And, uh, m and many of those children uh, actually who came from poverty ended up uh, achieving quite successful careers in the empire as a result of uh, her assistance in not only education, but also assistance to be able to live and have a place to live, food, a shelter, medical care, uh, you know, places uh, where seniors, the seniors could be taken care of. I mean, that was the first time in recorded history that there was any provision made for senior citizens to be taken care of by the state as such. Uh, in 802, uh, five years after she had been uh, sole ruler of the empire, even though for a dozen years before that she was regent and co-ruler, uh, she lost power due to a conspiracy which was led by Nikephoros, who was, uh, you might say, the finance minister of Constantinople. And uh, I believe the reason was that uh, he was really antagonized by her generosity and by cutting back on taxes, by lowering the taxes on poor people, eliminating taxes on poor people. And he wanted to uh, take her away from power so that he could put back some of the taxes, though not all of them were put back. Some were put back, but not, they couldn't possibly put back all the taxes that she had eliminated because that would have caused a revolt against Nikephoros himself. Uh, so as far as uh, it definitely seems, that was the main reason because the popularity among the people was great. Uh, she, after that, uh, she, she was removed from power. Uh, she, no one could touch her. She wasn't tortured, she wasn't killed. Uh, she was placed in retirement and she went uh, first to the island of Principo. I think that's how it's probably, well, we'll have to check. Uh, she, she was retired to an island monastery, which apparently she had founded herself. She, for nuns, uh, nunnery, you might say. One of the peculiar things about Irene was that she used the title of emperor rather than empress uh, in her documents and edicts. And that's according to tradition at that time, the tradition of the Roman Empire, that the full power could only be held by a man. So she used the male title. And it's not that different from actually uh, Egypt, uh, which was part of the Roman Empire, because Cleopatra's official title was Pharaoh, which was a male title. So she was a pharaoh. Pharaoh is the same as an emperor. Some sources say she ended her life in a nunnery on the island of Lesbos, having tonsured with the name Eugenia. And uh, her success, especially in setting the basis for the end of iconoclasm, is celebrated in this, on the Sunday of Orthodoxy, and the name is mentioned. To Irene of pious memory, our pious and ever memorable queen, who by the divine 
and angelic habit was renamed Evgenia Nun, Eonia Imnimi. 